Well, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name's Andy Watson. I'm a professor at the University of Exeter uh, in the UK. And I my field of expertise is carbon and nutrient cycles on the planet. And I'm also an oceanographer, so I, I concentrate on the uh, marine side of that. So what I want to do this afternoon is, as my title slide says, I want to tell you about why we need the Go BGC Argo Array uh, to improve the global carbon budget. So here's an outline of my talk. Um, very simple. I'm going to say why we need uh, a global carbon budget. I thought I'd first try to persuade you that we uh, that it's an important thing to do and I'll say about how we are doing it now and how I hope that the Go BGC Argo, Argo is going to improve it. So first, why do we need a global carbon budget? Why should we be worried about where the carbon dioxide that we humans emit uh, is going? Well, one thing that the space age has taught us is that we live on an island. The Earth is, is an oasis of life, abundant and complex life, surrounded by a sea of empty space. There are no other islands like ours reachable You've probably seen this picture before. It's called the pale blue dot sometimes. It's a picture of the Earth taken from 4 billion miles away by Voyager 1, still inside the solar system. So in a sense, not that far away from Earth, but you can see uh, it emphasizes how lonely and isolated the planet is. We're not gonna get off this planet in the near future or even the relatively distant future. So we have to uh, make our stand here. We have to be able to live on this planet, on this island. Now humans have been on Earth for around 300,000 years. And that's just the last very briefest moment in the four billion year history of life on Earth that's enabled this extraordinary place to exist at all. And just since the Industrial Revolution, in the last one thousandth of the time that we've been here, our population has expanded hugely into the billions. And more than that, in the last 50 years, we've taken essentially all the resources of the planet to ourselves. We've come to dominate all the biogeochemical cycles that form the life support system of planet Earth. So now we essentially are the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle of the planet. And these are the cycles that have kept the planet uh, in a habitable state for the last four billion years. So it's a dangerous situation to be in that we have taken all the resources of the planet of this island. I put this slide in to uh, remind us of what can happen uh, in the worst possible case. This is a classic study of reindeer on a small island in the Bering Sea, uh, who about 30 of them were introduced in the 1940s. By the 1960s, there were 6,000 of them. They greatly exceeded the carrying capacity of the island at that point. And then there were a couple of bad years um, and the population crashed and indeed it never recovered. They went extinct. So we don't want that to happen to humans on Earth. Fortunately, we are more intelligent than, than reindeer, aren't we? Um, I hope so. And we have our foresight, we have science, and for the last 50 or so years, we've been using those to try to work out 
what's going to happen in the future. So this is from IPCC models. Uh, this is one particular output of them. It's the amount of carbon dioxide that's going into the oceans. And as you can see, there's a, a big wide spread of what models suggest might happen in the next uh, over the next century. Most of that spread is due to the fact that we don't know how much carbon dioxide we're going to emit, but quite a substantial uh, uncertainty is also due to the fact that we don't know exactly what the processes are that are taking up carbon dioxide now into the natural world and that will uh, continue or not to do so into the future. So now I'll tell you a bit about how we currently uh, work out how carbon dioxide, how much carbon dioxide is going where. Broadly speaking, the uh, the sources of carbon dioxide, have, which are here in the red circle, have to match the sinks of carbon dioxide. And the sources are fossil fuel burning. Uh, and we know rather well how much fossil fuel we burn. And something that we know rather less well about is how much uh, carbon dioxide is released to the atmosphere by deforestation and other land use change. And these sources have to match the sinks. The sinks, the largest sink is the atmosphere. So, so a good part, about half of the carbon dioxide that we emit stays is staying in the atmosphere and building up and that's why atmospheric co2 is increasing but it's not all staying there some of it is going into the vegetation on the land so the vegetation that's not being cut down is tending to absorb year on year more carbon dioxide and some of it is going into the oceans and that's what the what the Go BGC array in particular will help us with. So how do we arrive at all of these numbers? This slide shows you those sources and sinks again, this time plotted through time in the in mostly the 20th century and pretty much up to today. You see again those sources, the fossil fuels and cement and land use change above the horizontal line and the sinks, uh, land, atmosphere and ocean below the line and the sources equal the sinks. Now, how do we get these? Well, the atmosphere, we can measure how much carbon dioxide is, is going into it and we can do that rather well by observing the increase. So we've been doing that since uh, Keeling began his measurements at Mauna Loa in the 1950s. Fossil fuel, we have rather good estimates of how much fossil fuel we're burning, so that's no problem. We got rather poor estimates of how much land use change deforestation is uh, producing, but it's a smaller source than fossil fuels. And then that leaves the natural sinks. Now, the ocean, up to now has mostly actually been modeled rather than by using uh, observations, mostly, not exclusively. Uh, and then the uptake by vegetation is done by difference. Uh, if, it's an, if a source, if the net sources are not going into the ocean, they're not staying in the atmosphere, they must be taken up by, by vegetation. This is changing, especially we would like to use data and observations to, to get at the ocean, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Uh, and we are beginning to be able to use uh, models for the, the vegetation. It's much easier, it's much easier to measure the amount of carbon dioxide going into the ocean from the atmosphere than it is to measure the net amount going into the land surfaces. And uh, if I zoom in on the south coast of the UK, 
I can show you why that is. The oceans are quite variable in space, but they're nothing like as variable as the land surfaces. So each of those little dots in uh, uh, on the land surface represents a different type of vegetation with a different uh, uptake or release of carbon dioxide. And furthermore, there's huge amounts going into the, the, the land vegetation during the days and during the summer, and, and most of it comes out in huge fluxes in the nighttime and the winter. On the oceans, the variability uh, from daytime to nighttime and from uh, summer to winter is much, much less. So it turns out that with a relatively smaller number of measurements, we can in fact measure how much carbon dioxide is going into the oceans in a way that's proving very difficult for the land. So let me compare the estimates of the ocean sink for CO2 from the atmosphere uh, as uh, computed by models with those made from such data and observations as we have. So this is a graph of what the models used by the Global Carbon Project uh, for this quantity uh, show. And for reasons that um, I guess are historical, you'll note that the, um, that the y-axis is inverted. That is to say, as we go down, uh, the sink is getting bigger. And the light gray lines are individual models and the heavy line is their average. And you can see they have a wide, uh, there's a wide spread. They don't agree particularly well on the absolute numbers. They do all agree that the sink is increasing over time. Um, and there's a fair amount of year to year variability. Now here are some estimates made from observations from data products. And we have a few of those and there's there are actually three here. Again, the heavy line is the average of the three. So if we compare the models and the data, uh, this is the average of the models and the average of the data, you can see that they share some similarities. In, in particular, they do agree that it's in the, the sink is generally increasing with time and some of the year-to-year -year variability is kind of similar between them but they also have important differences and in particular the data suggests there's been a change in the rate of uptake the rate the increase in the sink the rate at which is increasing from uh, before about 2000 and after 2000. Whereas the models uh, really don't show that at all. They, they show very little change uh, in the rate at which the CO2 sink is increasing. So there's, and this is quite important because you can see that as uh, time goes on, the discrepancy between the models and the, the data is getting uh, larger and larger. So which of them is right? Well, I would have to say that we're not absolutely certain uh, which is right. I'm an observationist, so I tend to think that the data are probably right. This shows you what our main source of the observations from which we are currently getting the uptake of CO2 into the oceans. It's called SOCAT, uh, stands for Surface Ocean Carbon Atlas. Uh, and it's a largely voluntary effort where researchers all over the world who are measuring surface carbon dioxide levels from which we can calculate the flux into the ocean, put their data into a freely available database. Now you can see that the coverage looks pretty good in uh, if you just look at all of the data in SOCAT, which is what we're looking at here, in the Northern Hemisphere in particular, there are some holes in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. The coverage looks good, but actually it's not really adequate. Uh, it's actually 
if one looks at a single year by contrast to all of the data as the the two plots at the in the upper part here are the north atlantic measured and the measurements that were done there in the year 2017 and the year 2018 and in 2017 there were five or six ships commercial ships with uh, sensors on board that were doing measurements in the atlantic and that actually is quite a good coverage it's good enough to work out how much carbon dioxide was going into the ocean that year in 2018 uh, by contrast there's a big hole in in the atlantic and that's because uh, some research projects ran out of money and uh, had to stop uh, working and they haven't been uh, they haven't been restored up to this date if we look at the bottom plot here that's all of the data in collected in southern ocean winter between the years 2000 and 2018 as you can see there's not a lot except around drake passage where uh, research ships supplying the antarctic research bases were were crossing regularly so this is wintertime data there's more in other seasons but wintertime is important in in the southern ocean so this data is actually not adequate to work out uh, accurately how much CO2 is going into to the ocean. And that's why we need the global BGC float array. It will not only enable us to calculate those surface fluxes because the floats come to the surface every 10 days, uh, it will also tell us where in the ocean the carbon is going from those profiles uh, subsurface, which we mostly don't have at the moment. And we can work out from that how long it's likely to stay there, which is, of course, important. If it stays that some of it will stay there for thousands of years, but some of it may come out within decades, which would be a very different outcome. So to show you something of how useful the BGC Argo floats can be in calculating uh, the, the flux of CO2 into the oceans. I'm going to talk about some work by Seth Buschinski and his colleagues in the SOCOM project, which is sort of the pilot for GoBGC in the Southern Ocean, where they've been releasing floats since 2014. Uh, so Seth is our, our postdoc now at the University of Hawaii and this paper was published a couple of years ago uh, what he the top line shows the data from uh, shipborne SOCAT uh, measurements in the years up to 2017 and then the 2014 to 2017 uh, coverage so there is some coverage from ships during this time but there's a lot more coverage from the SOCOM floats in the 2014 to 2017 period. So Seth and his colleagues took that uh, data and they calculated air sea fluxes of carbon dioxide and compared them to calculations done with only the uh, with the, the ship data. So the green and the blue lines here show you uh, estimates made by various gap filling techniques like neural networks of the flux of, of CO2 into the ocean in the Southern Ocean uh, over the period from 1985. And then for the time period for 2014 onwards, they have also got estimates of uh, made using the SOCOM floats and those are the black and purple bars at the, um, uh, at the on the right of the diagram and you can see you get substantially different fluxes from uh, when one puts the SOCOM floats in now is that because the previous measurements simply don't have enough they have not enough measurements and so they're essentially wrong or perhaps it's because the Southern Ocean really is very variable, or maybe the we don't know quite how to deal with these uh, float measurements yet. 
So all of that is ongoing research, I would say. But it looks likely that the uh, that the SOCOM project is going to fundamentally change our estimates of uh, CO2 going into the Southern Ocean. And they went further in this paper, having made those changed estimates of the CO2 flux into the ocean, they use those in combination with atmospheric data to estimate how much that changes our estimates of how much is going into the land. Because as I say, if, you, if well, the flux of if the carbon dioxide that we've released, which we know how much we've released, is not going into the oceans uh, and it's not staying in the atmosphere, it must be going into the land. And so these ocean estimates make a substantial uh, change in the amounts of carbon dioxide which are thought then to be going into the land uh, in the southern hemisphere in this in this case. So this shows you that basically if one gets good estimates of the carbon dioxide going into the ocean, as we hope GoBGC will do for us, then we can uh, use those to improve and get better estimates for what's going into the land. Now, we GoBGC is not uh, the be all and end all. We really need and should be putting in place a an adequate carbon observing system for uh, the oceans uh, as a whole and the bgc argo will be an absolutely critical part of of that but we also need satellites that are uh, being flown now and are being planned in the near future we need we continue to need research research ships and uh, commercial ship measurements which perform a great uh, service as the ultimate uh, gold standard if you like of uh, surface co2 measurements and which we can use to calibrate the bgc argo and we need um, gliders and new sorts of autonomous surface vessels etc as well especially we will need those in shelf seas uh, because the go BGC array for the most part is an open ocean array and won't go into shelf seas. So to conclude, uh, we're changing our island home, our planet, very rapidly. We've come to dominate the uh, biogeochemical cycles that have kept it habitable up until now and we need to know what we're doing. We need a monitoring system so that we know the effects that we're having. This is a cost effective use of our resource. It's a vital, uh, vitally important. Global BGC Argo will hugely improve our knowledge of the carbon uptake by the oceans and that's a critical component of the global carbon cycle. It will also improve our estimates of uptake by the land at the global and continental scale, certainly. And budgeting where our carbon goes is important so that we know where what we have emitted up to now is going and how long it's likely to stay there. And so that we can improve our models and get them right so that we know more about what the future holds for any given uh, pathway of uh, humanity in the future. So that's the end of my talk. Um, and I hope you'll you'll listen to the other talks on this in the seminar series.